is this guy? I, I was like, who is this guy? He's got 8,000 views. You're live? Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming at very short notice. Really, really appreciate it. Um, my name is Eilish Jordan. I live in Wandsworth Town, which is Putney constituency. Um, and I feel really strongly about lots of things that are going on in the world at the moment, local issues and global issues. Uh, I wrote one line which I wanted to share, which is, everyone thinks they live in interesting times, but we know we do. Um, and I feel that we need to be uh, engaging everybody in debate. Um, it shouldn't be politicians just talking on their own. Um, it should be that they share what they believe and what they can do for us, but also you share what you want and you ask questions. So I've been to a few hustings already. Some of them were a bit more interactive than others. We want to make this really interactive. That's, that's the hope and the aim. Can everybody hear me? Fantastic. Okay, so it is being live streamed. You can wave. I hope you're okay with, with, with that. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, start. So we basically, just to also clarify, every candidate was invited. Um, they received two emails um, and um, they were also given flyers. So um, I know it's short notice and obviously people have a lot to do. So I'm not, you know, casting aspersions on anyone for not coming. But I'm very happy to welcome Lee from the Conservative Party and Heiko from the Workers' Party. Um, so what we're going to do is... Oh, this is Heiko Ku from the Workers' Party. And I'm sorry, I'll give your name properly. This is Lee Jamie Roberts from the Conservative Party. I should give people's full names. Um, so, um, Could Heiko go over there? Because the sunlight's in your eyes okay. and it's casting a horrible... Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so, um, just, to, just to let you know, I did hear from the Rejoin EU Party... Uh, they said that they would like to have been here, but they couldn't make it. So I do have a statement to read out, which I will, um, after um, our two candidates here have read their, or given their opening statements. Um, and also Peter Hunter from Reform UK sends his sincere apologies. He really wanted to come, but couldn't make it. Um, but I haven't heard from the other parties. Okay. So um, what we will do is we will start with... Uh, Lee, if that's okay with you, uh, and he will talk for around four minutes, um, and then we will have Heiko, and then we'll take questions. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, th thanks for having us. I mean, what I hope will be probably the most enjoyable of the hustings I've been to so far, because it feels much more intimate. Um, some of them have been a bit formulaic, so this feels a bit more things may happen that we don't expect, which is good. Um, we really love we gave him to the pub earlier. Well, listen, I, I, I will take guidance. I love interactivity. So, listen, if you get bored, just say whatever, and I'll, and I'll get the message. Um, I'll tell you as much as I can about me, and I'll be as transparent as possible. Uh, please do. Uh, just push me and ask those questions. Um, I'm Lee Roberts. Um, I'm quite new to this. I've been involved in politics a long time ago at university. I've not done anything political, really, for much of the last 35 years. Um, I'm 55 now. I'll be 56 when the election's called. July the 2nd is my birthday. Um, and I come from a place called Walsall. Uh, if you'd been there, it's in the West Midlands, just off Junction, Junction 6. Noddy Holder, Ellie Simmons, and that's probably about it in terms of famous people there. So it's, 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 it's very distinctive. But that's where I was born and brought up. Um, normal background, uh, state educated, state primary, and then past 11 plus in 1979. Um, my school survived Labour's cuts against grammar schools in the 60s and 70s. And I'm lucky because it changed my life. Um, in that sense, I am literally a child of Thatcher. Because I passed 11 plus in February. She got elected in, was it May? And I went to school in September. So if that had changed, I wouldn't have perhaps had the chance I had. So education for me is absolutely transformative. And it's something I feel very passionate about because... I wasn't from a rich background. My dad had a little business. Um, Mom was a housewife. So I wasn't privileged in any way at all. 
Um, and it, not like Keir Starmer, whose father was a toolmaker, and he owned the factory. My dad owned the garage, but he employed two people. So it wasn't exactly a multinational industry. But that was our life growing up. And I went to the grammar school, and that trans- transformed my life. I was good at school, and I got to Oxford at the end of that, and had a great time there, and got involved in politics, uh, the Oxford Union, and also the Conservative Association. We were brought up with Conservative values, um, small business, and my dad always said to me, and mum as well, and this, this stays with me now, actually, she said, Labour wants to make everybody the same, equally poor, whereas the Tories want to give you a chance to do well. That, that's, and that stayed with me as a young child. It's very simplistic, but yeah, I've got to say, at the age of 55, it still rings true to me. And that's why I am what I am. I haven't really changed. I didn't have a left-wing phase. I've always roughly been the same. Um, so university ended, and I followed the world I wanted to work in, which was, which was advertising and media and broadcasting. So I joined radio stations and was involved in advertising sales then. And LBC Capital, loved it, then joined the launch team of Virgin Radio. Had a great time there, met my wife... And then um, we transformed what was a, a very poor AM frequency into the UK's most successful national commercial station. Then joined a team that was launching the O2. So they took Labour's Millennium Dome, the White Elephant, and turned it into the O2, which was the world's most successful entertainment music venue. So I know a little bit about transforming areas of London by vision, enterprise and hard work. And that's very much what's driven me through. I mean, I, I think you can transform lives by creativity and and vision and drive. And I want to try and do that now as much as is possible through politics. Um, I think we can do that here in Putney. Everyone's moaning about the high street, and I know it's in a terrible state, but so is every high street in the world. But I do think we can apply ourselves and look at what's a great opportunity and bring this to life. And I would like to do that if I was an MP. So I want, fundamentally, I want to apply myself and what I've done in my life and make that work for the people that I want to be involved with. Politics is interesting because it does change people's lives. I didn't believe in going to politics as a a post-student because I I really hate the idea of a 25-year-old going into politics and having no experience of life. That sounds really ageist, I'm sorry, but I just wanted to do more and find out what it was like to do work and and grow myself that way. So I have an issue that I think politics, and it has become a problem in the last 20, 30 years, of both main parties are run by kids who leave university, a politics degree. If they're Tories, they tend to work for um, a think tank (laughs) or they work for an MP and then they get involved in the Conservative Party and then they become an MP. That's not great. The Labour Party is the same. They go through student union politics, they then work for an MP or a trade union or a think tank and then they end up becoming an MP. They end up with no life experience. That's my, that's my criticism of politics generally. And I see it on both sides, and the Liberals as well, less so, but it's the, the two main parties. So I'm an anomaly. When I went for this election, which, is, by the way, is a bit like Dragon's Den, if you, not Dragon's sorry, uh, The Apprentice, if ever you get a chance to see that. When you go for an MP selection, you meet all sorts of odd people, and there's always an odd one, an idiot. Um, like, <laughs> um, but I was one of the two old blokes there. There were two old blokes with grey hair, who were, whereas most people going for selection are in their 30s. So what I'm trying to put forward is life experience is a key point of difference for me. Anyway, so why am I doing what I'm doing? Why do I think this is a key election? I'm very worried about the mood of the country now being very volatile. We know that. Everybody's angry. We've had ten years of nothing but politics, from Scottish independence and that debate then, through the whole thing around Brexit through the debates and the madness after Brexit, then COVID, then the Ukraine war, it's been nothing, and also elections all the way through. Everyone's angry and brittle for understandable reasons. We're sick of politics, but also we're angry about stuff. I want to try and be part of a generation that comes in to help calm things down and help to play a part in creating a Conservative Party which is much more in line with what people want and is not going to be volatile and is going to focus on the core values of giving people a smaller state more personal responsibility, and also, obviously, lower taxation. That's what I want, believe this party is best to do. That's what I want to try and achieve. I see now in Wandsworth a, a Labour party that people voted for because of part of the feeling of being anti-Tory, which is showing us the worst of Labour, which is doctrinaire. We all believe there should be more houses. Of course we do. 
they've taken the decision to shut down the Alton regeneration plan, which would have generated just over 1,000 houses, new homes, and they are now dashing, I think quite cruelly and quite dictatorially, to build as many houses as possible in West Putney on land like this. And it's annoying people. And you're saying, well, I don't want to do that because everybody has a right to enjoy a great environment. Green space, squirrels running around, trees, playgrounds, space to have a car. Labour aren't saying that. They're saying, well, tough, you know, we'll make a play of consultation, but actually we're just going to do it anyway. And I can see that. It's so cynical. So I'm passionate about this because that, to me, is the essence of what I'm trying to fight for, which is personal freedom to protect what we, what we have. I mean, yesterday's small C conservatism, we're not trying to be nimbies. We're just saying, this is a great area. We're lucky to live in Putney. I've lived in Lambeth for 30 years. You don't live in Lambeth. I'm, I'm not knocking Lambeth, but if you have a chance to have green space, fresh air... Lee. Sorry, sorry. That's probably sorry, about sorry, six sorry, minutes. Sorry, I think sorry, 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 sorry. But you're getting six minutes. Apologies. <laughs> I'm passionate about this. Sorry, I'm taking it to you. <laughs> Thank you. There'll be plenty more time to talk, don't you worry. <laughs> Please. I'm going to set it for six, and if you want it, it's yours. It might be less than that. <laughs> My name's Heiko Ku. I've been involved in politics since I was 17 years of age. My mother's German, my father's Chinese. I was born in London, and I became interested in politics partly because of my family background. Um, I was interested in history. Uh, Margaret Thatcher came to power when I went to South Thames College in Wandsworth and in Putney do my A-levels. And at the time, there was a threat of nuclear war. There was huge changes economically. Thatcher was bringing in her uh, liberal revolution, if you like, to privatise the economy. Then came the miners' strike and all this type of thing. So I became quite politically active at that time. And I didn't really stop doing that. I'm a hardcore socialist. Um, I supported Jeremy Corbyn uh, before, or, or when he stood for election as leader of the Labour Party. I produced his first video and uh, a summary of his views when he stood for leadership. I believe he made a number of mistakes. I believe he was too weak. He backed down too easily. He allowed people to push him around too easily. But he faced an enormous difficulty, and that was that the mass media and the institutions of the state... There was, you might remember, when Jeremy Corbyn was first elected, a serving general in the British Army said that they would be prepared to overthrow Jeremy Corbyn if he was to get rid of Trident nuclear weapons uh, by military force. And, OK, it was an outlier, but at the same time there was a systematic campaign against Jeremy Corbyn, orchestrated largely by a lobby controlled by Israel. You might have seen a film called The Labour Files, or you might have seen the Al Jazeera program about Labour's influence in, uh, about, sorry, about <laughs> Israel's influence in uh, removing Jeremy Corbyn as leader of the Labour Party. And the proof of that is comprehensive. It's one of the largest leaks in history. It's called the Labour Files. Um, it's a candidate for the Workers' Party, actually in Bow and Stratford, who revealed these files that show that the party, as uh, a senior figure said, is a criminal conspiracy against its own members. That's a very serious accusation, but the evidence is there. The party does not actually represent the organisation it's supposed to represent. A party should, and that would be true in my opinion for the Workers' Party, the Conservative Party, or any political party, it should represent what the members believe. The leadership should be able to put their, their point of view try and persuade them, get them to vote for one policy or another policy or a leader or another leader. But I believe that what has happened to politics, not only in Britain but internationally, is it has been captured by a tiny handful of large corporations and powerful lobbies that control the fate of humanity. And the only reason I'm actually standing, I'm, I've been speaking at Speaker's Corner for something like well, since 1985, the winter of 1985. And I basically like to do didactic stuff, and I like public speaking, and I like to discuss with people. I, I get involved in campaigns and, and activity where I think it's really a really important issue. I'll get involved, and I'll campaign, and enjoy demonstrations, and write, and, and, and publish videos, and stuff like that. But the reason why I stood this time is because in the last five years we have been through the most horrific transformations in our lives. 
And it's almost like I, I, I went to the meeting, the hustings, the, the last hustings, and when I mentioned these issues, they hadn't even come up as questions in the debate. Uh, it's true that the questions were questions on paper or, or had come by email, and, and therefore it was possible to sift out. But even in the questions that were sent in, I don't think they were raised. And that is the question of COVID. What happened to our world in the last five years? It was literally short, a few weeks after Boris Johnson came to power that the pandemic was declared. And our country, at that time, I wrongly, and I, I openly admit, I put out a video calling for a lockdown. I regret it. I deeply regret having done that. And that was put out in the beginning of March, 12th of March, uh, 2020. So 12 days before the lockdown. Then initially I thought, OK, well... You know, it was a sunny spring. It was weather like we've got now. And, uh, you know, and my life was reasonably OK. I stayed at home. It was OK for a few weeks. I thought for three weeks, if there was a lockdown, because the incubation, incubation period was supposed to be maximum two. So if you shut down for three weeks, then the whole thing would be over. And then it dragged on and on and on. And I followed, I'm half German, so I followed the scientists in Germany the experts in Germany, who I thought, you know, Germans are a bit like geeky scientifically. So I thought, as a nation, their experts are going to be up on it. And I started looking into it. And as I looked into it, I discovered that there was a gigantic fraud being perpetrated on the entire planet. And that gigantic fraud turned out to be orchestrated by a small network uh, run primarily by Bill and Melinda Gates. And they over a period of 20 years, had infiltrated, after moving out of uh, predominantly focusing on software, they infiltrated the WHO, and they set up a number of organisations that controlled the WHO. CEPI, the, uh, Garvey, the Vaccine Alliance, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They, they have got the biggest donations to the WHO of any organisation in the world, bigger than any country. And the consequence of that was mentioned by... That's sorry. six minutes now, so... <laughs> okay, I'll, 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 I'll come back to these things a little bit later on. But basically, I think that the, the world was turned into a dystopian nightmare and that the consequences of that have affected all of us, deeply, deeply affected all of us, and I'll be addressing those issues uh, over, a num uh, over the whole of the discourse, discourse of, that we have this evening. So uh, those are the first points. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your fantastic opening speeches. So questions. Who here has a question? Oh, my gosh, thank you so much for reminding me. Uh -huh. Call myself a teacher. Thank you so much for that. Really appreciate it. Right, let me get it. I have it on my phone here as a picture, so I will read it out to you. Right. So, um, this is from the Rejoin EU party. I am standing in the general election for Putney constituency to demonstrate my and my party's rejection of Brexit. The last eight years have been a time of chaos and division in this country, and no single factor in this chaos has been more important than Brexit. Brexit is the single biggest problem undermining our society. It's the engine behind the cost of living crisis, it's reducing our ability to live, work, and holiday abroad, and it takes away from the next generation the educational opportunities we could all enjoy through Erasmus. Brexit has undermined British prestige and credibility in the world. Governmental rhetoric about the UK's world-beating international position is a hollow sham. By the big parties not mentioning Brexit, we have one of the most dishonest elections we've ever seen. My claim to be the next MP for this constituency rests on my willingness to point out this dishonesty and raise my political voice against it. That's why I'm putting myself forward in this election. If elected, I will ensure Parliament has at least one voice calling out Brexit for what it is, a con. I hope and believe that as time goes by, there will be more MPs from a range of parties who agree with me. Putney has the opportunity to take the lead by sending a rejoiner to Parliament in 2024.
they can be sure that my voice will always be speaking up against Brexit and for the Rejoin cause. So that's on behalf of the Rejoin party. Thank you very much. Rejoin EU party. <laughs> Lovely. So, questions. Over to you. Yeah, and I, I, um, for the live streaming, a microphone is coming to you. Thank you very much for coming down. Really appreciate it. My name's Dave Atkins. I'm 35 and based in Hayward. And my question is re regarding, um, sorry, I'm a little bit shy, um, regarding gender, I'd say ideology or d gender identity. Now, I have uh, four lovely nieces, um, the fourth of which is the eldest, and I've got three much younger ones. My concern, especially, is them growing up and this whole thing, which I personally think is ridiculous, where apparently there's this kind of this gender fluid debate where, you know, the, the very concept of whether you're male or female is antiquated. And this, this whole kind of basis of where it's just not rooted in science at all. That's my major concern for them growing up and, you know, what's being taught in schools increasingly with this kind of, you know, this, this increase on, oh, yeah, you know, there's apparently a broad spectrum of 200 different genders. That's something that really concerns me, and I, I was just wondering your kind of your party stance and where each of you stand on that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, can we start with uh, Thank you. Okay, I was initially sceptical when people told me that there's some sort of campaign and movement to promote this as an ideology, no, sorry, to move across because of light, yes, as yes. a specific ideology. And then I began to look into it, and, and I had many friends who were involved in all sorts of, you know, the gay or, or trans or whatever type of people. I'd, I've got friends who, who, who identify as that. But then when I began to investigate it, I did discover that there, there is an ideology, and it's being promoted by certain billionaires from the United States of America and I think really why many liberals and lefties got sucked into it is because they abandoned the idea of socialism. So the labor movement was always based around the working classes would take over and run industry and society and create a democratic socialist society based on public ownership dominating the economy and people administering themselves. And when they began to abandon these ideas, they began to look around elsewhere in the world for alternative ideas about types of oppression that they could take up. And one that was ready-made for them was a manipulative gender debate whereby this insanity is imposed upon people that you have to, for example, in schools or colleges, declare what pronouns you're using when you're talking. I am totally opposed to that type of mindset. I think it's divisive. I think it splits the working classes and it poisons the atmosphere and it makes people who, who go along with this uh, pretend to be somehow superior to other people and that you, the working classes don't understand how to say uh, 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 whatever it is, them or they or whatever uh, uh, these pronouns are. So I'm totally opposed to that. Having said that, I completely accept anyone's, if someone's got sexual preferences, whatever, I, I've got no problem whatsoever with that. But you're right, it should not be promoted as a, an issue like they did with the Tavistock, Tavistock that children can go and get puberty blockers without even their parents knowing. Which, by the way, coming back to it, and I'll just finish on this, mm -hmm. was the same thing they did during COVID. They said eventually that children over 12 could independently decide whether or not to get a vaccination for COVID, even though they had no reason whatsoever for any children to get the COVID vaccinations. And so I, I am in agreement with you on this question. And I think Lee will probably be as well, actually. <laughs> Thank you. That was dead on two minutes. Well, Amazing. Wow. This might disappoint you because we, we, we have a not dissimilar view, um, probably for different reasons. But I, mean, I, I start with a fairly simple, pragmatic view that there are two sexes. I know there's a tiny proportion, tiny proportion of people that are born into sex, but that is a very small group of people. Um, I try and reduce it, to, reduce it to a fairly simple phrase that there are two sexes, but there are millions of lifestyles. And I think gender is the wrong term to use. Um, you can be a, a male, female, but you can pursue any life, you know, within reason, within within the bounds of, of not of not causing someone else harm. 
then that's okay. Um, and so, again, back to my own passion for personal liberty, freedom to live the lives that we should lead, that, we, that will fulfil us. I always say to my kids, the three things are be healthy, be happy, be fulfilled. That covers, I think, most things. Then you can be happy. And if, if fulfilment means having a, a sexual identity, that's fine. You know, as long as you're not abusing anyone else and, you, you're, you're, you know, and the law is there to protect people, that's fine. So I am very, very tolerant about those things. And, and, and that, thankfully, is the way that pretty much all parties are now. What's interesting, though, and funny, we were a debate about a week ago, and um, we were the only voices in that seven party. Well, we didn't have the, the Reform Party, but of the six parties there, we were the only part. We were the only two that took that view. Everyone else was sort of competing to take increasingly. Um, I felt quite quite outlandish claims about protecting people and giving rights, um, rights for personal freedom, expression, absolutely. But when it gets into potentially self harm which I worry about as a father, um, then, that, then that's a big concern. I mean, I'll make a political point now that we, we've, we are now in, in, the, in the Equality Act making sure that biological sex is a protected status. And that's purely because I worry pragmatically about safe spaces for women. Oh, that's 15 Sorry. minutes. <laughs> OK, or, or, or the other thing is fair competition for athletes. But you can see where I'm coming from this one. Thank you. Thank you. Um, does that answer your question? Um, well, I, by extension, um, it cover a lot of bases. bases. Um, I, I was also thinking by extension with this kind of, you know, people identifying as certain things. Like I've heard the most outrageous, outrageous claims from people saying, you know, I identify as a, as a cucumber, therefore mm. don't eat me. Or, some, yeah. This is a thing. Yeah. And a lot of the major corporations that a lot of you guys mentioned before, they're kind of adhering to this nonsense, quite frankly, where, you know, I see on the forms, it's like, oh, what, what are your pronouns? Are they he, him? And, and it's, it just seems so ridiculous because even just, you know, 15 years, a mere 15 years ago, you know, you would have been laughed and mocked yeah. at. And now it's being treated yeah. as fact. It's like, well, you know, what's, what's kind of happened to society as a whole? Yeah. You kind of just kind of cowered and, mm. you know, adhered to this, mm. this very kind of small vocal minority. And weirdly, they're kind of now starting to rise in power. And yeah. I don't know, it just, it, it just seems like if, if I'm just talking basic logic about, oh, by the way, there are two genders, male and female, since, you know, practically the dawn of time, it's like mm. a, it's almost like I'm offending someone personally. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's just really ridiculous. I Great. Don't understand. Thank you. So Thank you. I'm glad we answered the question. Thank you. Um, next question. Yep, yeah, please. I realise I don't need to move because I'm mic'd up, so you, you guys can move to the. Hi, my name is uh, Ali. I'm 52 and I live in Wandsworth Town, just by Southside Shopping Centre. Uh, my question for both of you is about the terrible state of the Metropolitan Police. I'll keep it brief because um, I could go on and on. Essentially, my question is, you know, the Metropolitan Police is, uh, is uh, systematically racist, homophobic, sexist, misogynistic, uh, everything, every pronoun you can use in the book, but not, not the pronouns you're talking about. <laughs> uh, I was homeless, briefly, before I ask you what you're going to do about that. That's going to be my question. You know, I was homeless, uh, um, yes, uh, because of domestic violence, yes. Males can also be victims of domestic violence. So, uh, and do you know what? While I was homeless, and as many of you know, single males are right at the bottom of the queue when it comes to being rehoused, uh, and I had nowhere to sleep apart from parks and commons, do you know who were the most hurtful, upsetting, and um, worse than that, you know, the... the uh, so I wanted to make me commit suicide, it wasn't my abusers, it was the Metropolitan Police going to Lavender Hill Police Station as a victim and being bullied, harassed, um, uh, made to feel like I was a suspect when I was going to Lavender Hill mm. Police Station to report yet another incident of domestic violence against me. You know, it was the police mm. rather than anyone else that would have made me commit suicide, Metropolitan Police in Wandsworth when I was homeless. Okay. Um, so we, know for, 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 so we know for years and years and years there's a problem. Stephen Lawrence 
uh, High Court judge said the Metropolitan Police is, uh, is systematically racist. Uh, it's been found yet again recently. You know, there was um, uh, uh, another inquiry wasn't there mm. and uh, a barrister was asked to look at the Metropolitan Police and she also concluded the same. What's 30 years on from mm. Stephen Lawrence? So, so we know all these things that are in the police for years and years and years and years. So what, what are you guys going to actually okay. do about it? Great question. Thank you. Um, this time, can we start, please? Let's, please. Thank you. Um, the, the house is not, not in order, and I get that and understand it. Um, I've, I've seen the reports that make all the points you've made about institutional, etc., a bunch of isms, um, which are not what we want from our policing force. Um, culture is key in any institution, whether it's a business, whether it's a school, whether it's a, a police force. Um, I mean, I've, I've focused on lots of issues and I'll just do that for a second, uh, which concern me, which are the, the sort of practical outcomes of, of policing in the capital. I mean, I'll make the political point now that crime is going down across the UK. It is. I mean, uh, and I think there are reasons for that um, that we can almost take out of the political discussion, which are down to things like demography. Uh, an older population, um, essentially, it's down to the fact that the, the, the key age for offending tends to be teenagers. And if teenagers are a small proportion of society, then crime relatively goes down. But that, that's not designed to be an apology. It's just saying democracy factor. The fact that there's so much fear of crime and so much concern about the way that crime is being investigated and you know, managed by, by the policing agency indicates that it's not perfect. And I think, certainly in London, there are many things about the way the police has been, have been managed by, by the mayor. And I'll, I'll say that now because I, I think the mayor is the, is the chief police uh, manager in, in London. Um, and so responsibility lies with that person. Other, other places, it's the PCC. In London, it's the mayor is the mayor and also <coughs> the head of police. Um, and I think there are too many things which indicate poor culture and poor performance that have come from this mayor. So I remain, as you may have read, a fierce critic of the mayor. And if I was MP, one of the things I'd do here is hold the mayor to account. Um, because I don't think a Labour MP will hold to account a Labour government on your behalf, or a Labour council on your behalf, look at this situation, um, or a Labour mayor. You've got to have some opposition. So that's always been my, my key point to put forward is why I want you to vote for me, because I can hold them to account. Let's get back to the other point now about, about police culture. The culture's clearly not right. I mean, they know that, and they keep saying it. But the Sarah Everard situation is horrific. I mean, I can't think of a more horrific situation than that. We do deserve better. I mean, to be fair, the police say this themselves, and they recognise these points. But it's, it's only, what, four, th four years ago? Is it, no, three years ago this happened. And clearly, there's enough evidence to show that they knew about this for some months and probably years beforehand. So clearly, it needs, it needs investigation reform. I mean, there's a lot of work to be done, and... and uh, it would be wrong for me to stray into areas of future policy because I'm here to defend the manifesto and what we've done previously, um, and I'll, I'll stick by that line. But, I mean, if I was an MP, um, I have a whole list of things that I want to do in policy terms that I won't go into now because it's unfair to the party that's backing me. Mm. But policing is one of those things. Um, how we manage crime generally. But that, that's, a, that's a future conversation to have, which is probably not fair to have in this, this, this mm. time now. But I agree. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. And I hold... I hold the, the culture within the Met as a key factor, and I also hold the Mayor to account for that, because That's he's the one. Two minutes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Heike. Yeah, I... During the last five years, which is the main time when I've had dealings with the police, I was arrested seven times during the lockdowns. Um, as soon as I... Because I was speaking at Speaker's Corner, I went to Speaker's Corner to defend Speaker's Corner, and the police would come, there would be van loads of them, literally waiting for me to walk into the park. As soon as I walked into the park, the police would come, Dr. Ku, leave the park now. And I said, what about all the other people? And then they just basically just harassed me. So they targeted me and harassed me. And the funny thing was there was sort of, you begin to, once you begin to have problems dealing with these institutions, it's not just the police, it's, it's a lot of bureaucratic institutions, you suddenly find them closing ranks, and behaving in insipid ways. So one of them used to come regularly to my house, knock on my door, 
threatened me, basically. Um, he would pick on me at Speaker's Corner as well. And then when I was arrested, I was arrested on the 28th of November at a demonstration just as we left Hyde Park. And I was a journalist at the time. I had a member of the National Union of Journalists card. And that means you're supposed to be able to move between police lines, through the, go to a demonstration, walk between police lines, show your card. <laughs> and instead of this, uh, I was targeted by the police. And, and when they, they just grabbed me, bundled me to the floor. And then a senior officer came over and said, take his press card off him. Take his press card off him. And so there's a collusion and this is the, one of the most sinister things of recent times, between the police authority and the National Union of Journalists. I discovered, and I asked the National Union of Journalists to provide uh, the, my subject access request. In other words, all the information they've got about me. When I requested this from the leadership of the National Union of Journalists, it turned out they were colluding with the Metropolitan Police to have me delegitimized as a journalist because I was opposing the lockdowns. So I'm familiar with the type of, of manipulation that takes place. As, in, as soon as you kick up a bit of a stink, uh, they move on you. At the Sarah Everard event, for example, um, they cancelled the right of the, of the women to hold a, a vigil. And I went down there and spoke. Some people said, oh, you should never have spoken. You should never have caused the trouble. And I went down there and said, this is not a... Com because they tried to make it, you know, again, one of these gender war games. They said, and this was a manipulation by the media... They said, in advance of that vigil, because at that time, don't forget, it was the darkest days of lockdown, and that girl was killed because of lockdown, because she was walking on her own across the park in the darkest, and then the guy pulled her over and said, you're out under lockdown, get in the car. Pulled out his gun, raped her, burnt her body, murdered her. That's two minutes, so we're never... Sorry, uh, yeah, okay. Oh, oh, wow. Okay. That was a, what well, an ending. Well, not <laughs> an ending. Finish, so finish the, 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 the ending, yeah. end point is this, is that they said this was a male versus female thing. And I said on that demonstration, this is us against the police who are out of control. Mm -hmm. And that fact that they were two years allowed to exercise unlimited control in, in, infected the whole culture in the police. And there are something like 800, I think it's 20,000 Metropolitan Police, 800 of them up on charges. 800 out of 20,000. That's a sick culture. So we need to democratise power over the police. The community needs to be more involved in controlling the behaviour of the police. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you, you can. Yep. It's a debate. So I'll come back to you. We talked about culture, um, and culture is, is, a, is a problem here. It would be wrong with me just for the record, not to recognise the fact that there are far more good police doing a difficult job than there are bad police. And I have to sort of make that point because it's easy, as in any debate, for us to be focused on the bad things. And there are, we know, very notorious bad things. But most officers are doing a difficult job. They really are. Um, we just want to make sure that there are more of those guys with a better culture than there are the ones that are not doing a good job. So we have to make that point. I mean, obviously, this, the frame of this, this, this question was about the problems in culture, and there are problems, and we recognise those problems. But there is also the very real, very real need to recognise that the police largely, largely do a good job, a very good job under difficult situations. So let's just have to make that point just so I'm giving them a fair, a fair yeah. hearing. I mean, just one point I'll make here. In partly... Sorry, I'll be really quick. In Putney, in the last 12 months, there has been a much better, a much better, I think, policing approach to crime, which has resulted in, in a lowering of crime in many areas. Wandsworth Town, actually, is the one where it's not, it's out of control. But just to, but I, I, because I've, I'm a bit of an anorak, I love the figures. I go through the figures every month and I look at them. And there was a severe problem that resulted in massive, massive increase in violence, street, uh, uh, vehicle crime in 22, 23. To be fair to the police at the moment in Putney, they're doing a better job. So I'll just give it, and, that, and that's evidenced by the figures. Thank you. Culture-wise. Um, I think you wanted to say something quickly, Hagar. Thank you. Thank uh, you. I mean, I tend to agree. It's not every police officer who's bad. The problem is an institutional relationship. When you've got bureau bureaucracies, and it's a general problem of bureaucracy, the NHS, for example, or policing. So me and Lee go out as police officers, and we do something, 
We make a little mistake, we cover it up. He says, cover it up, will you? It's only a little infraction. I say, OK. And the next time it escalates. And this is the basic culture that develops, that creates criminal mindsets inside the police force and criminal mindsets that accept the criminality as a standard type of behaviour. And like, I won't question what you do, you don't question what I did. It's even the same in the NHS. NHS doctors, and there was a very good programme, I can't remember the name, but I'm sorry, but there's a very good programme on TV about a doctor who was committing, basically, mistakes all the time. And the doctor, the other doctors and nurses, very reluctant to say anything. And it becomes terrible. And I've got a friend who's a doctor, and she told me when she was first working under a consultant, it's a horrible story, but I'll give it very short, someone had come in who'd coughed out their lungs. And they basically had to feed the lungs back in very, very, very carefully. And they did manage to do that. And then the consultant said, OK, two days, no food and water. Um, and then she was watching him very carefully. And, and she, 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 when 48 hours were up, she said to the consultant, he's not ready yet. If you give him something to eat now, he won't work. And the consultant said, 48 hours! The guy coughed his lungs out and died. You know, and this is the type of thing going on institutionally all the time. And that's why we need control over these bureaucracies and we need supervision of these bureaucracies. Okay, thank you so much. Does it answer your question? Yes. As it's a debate, I think we have, uh, we have uh, 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 permission to be direct. I'm afraid the Tory gentleman's answer was typical Tory wish-wash, which shows absolutely no understanding of what it's really like to be victimised by the police. You know, I'm afraid, you know, it was just... Sorry, I have to, we're here at Hustings, I have to be honest. It, 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 was, it was just wish-wash, saying nothing. Uh, the gentleman for which party are you, sir? Workers party. The Workers' Party. Hit the nail on the head. You, you've, you've shown, unlike my respected friend over there, that you, are, you understand what the people are going through, you understand what it's like to be harassed by the police when you're just trying to be a good citizen. Um, and uh, I would just say one thing that sort of, you know, I, I, I think that one of the things that I've often said is that we need to take power away from them. So, for example, cyber internet crime needs to be a different organisation. Um, uh, political crime needs to be another uh, organisation because the trouble is, is at the moment the Met are being given more and more and more and more and more power. And as you so rightly said, you know, their egos are going through the roof and it's just feeding this culture of, I am super powerful, you are rubbish, and uh, no matter whether you're a victim in a moment of severe distress or a criminal, I will use this excuse to bully you. Um, I'm getting paid £47,000 a year to do it and I've even heard my friend, some, uh, a friend who works at Paddington Green Police Station say this to me, and if there is serious crime, like a knife incident on the radio, I will avoid that, and I would rather go out and harass pretty women in Clapham Junction for parking on a double yellow line, because it feeds my ego, and I get £30,000, £40,000 a year for it. But, um, but yeah, no, you, you definitely hit the nail on the head, thank you. I'm just mindful of time because we have to be out of here by nine. So let's let's get as many questions in as we can. Okay, next question. Uh, Roberts. Roberts from, sorry, I'm so bad with surnames. I remember his name because it's so unusual, from the uh, Conservative Party. Okay, and um, uh, every other candidate was invited to send their apologies, and I didn't hear from the others. So, sorry, uh, question. I think the gentleman at the back had a question. The lady, uh, the lady in the grey, you go for it, please. Yeah. We've got plenty of time, we'll get more in. different things but I just can't believe that that is going on and we are not calling for a ceasefire in Gaza and we're literally supporting Israel in what they're doing in terms of the genocide in Gaza and the other thing that annoys me similarly is that we are supporting Ukraine 
and Ukraine can never win this war against Russia. Yet we are watching young men on both sides being killed and a terrible thing happening within that, um, you know, that place. And I just feel we've lost our way in terms of what's important and where are the peacemakers now? Where are the people that can negotiate some kind of peaceful settlement? And we're just making Russia this sort of incredible enemy and we're threatening nuclear... I mean, I used, to, I used to be in the CND, you know, I was out there, ban the bomb and all that. But now we're not just playing with people in, you know, people next door to us. We're playing with superpowers. This is ridiculous. Where, where are the peacemakers? What do the part, why don't the parties support um, Gaza and call for a ceasefire? We're not tempted to go on I think the war in Gaza is, or the war against Gaza, is a seminal moment in our lives. There aren't many times when tens of thousands of people are slaughtered on live television and we watch it and, and basically feel impotent. And I've been on many of the demonstrations uh, about Gaza. We organised a platform to get people up to speak. Because one of the aspects of the protest movements in, in London is that they've been going on a long time, like you say, CND and so on, so they've become quite institutionalised. The consequence of that is we go on a demonstration, we march from A to B, and then we listen to a few speakers and we go home. And then a month later we're called out for another demonstration. I don't think that's enough. If you really want to stop the barbarity we are seeing today, you need to push further and you need to be more militant in the action that is taken about this issue, because it is interpenetrating with our own state. The problem is that in Britain, the political parties have long been, not completely, but a significant proportion of the political parties are in the pay of Israel. And in relation to the Labour Party, it's overwhelming. The Labour Party leadership is basically subordinate to Israel. And they do what it says. And that's why they came out with all these allegations about anti-Semitism with Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy Corbyn doesn't have an... He may be many things, and many people may dislike him, but he doesn't have an ounce of anti-Semitism or racism in him. And for them to turn him then into this anti-Semite, and for all the media to say that's true, and for all the politicians to say that's true, shows you how mad the world has become. And the political life that they tell us is a lie. And then they turned around and said, well, October the 7th, this terrible catastrophe, and it was a terrible thing, but at the same time, you know, I remember when I was in East Berlin when the Berlin Wall fell. Who's calling for the removal of the, of, of the wall in Palestine that holds the people in a concentration camp? And it's no wonder that when you hold, you only brutalise people and you hold them in a concentration camp, when they break out, they break out and they're celebrating that they broke out. And they think, we'll take some down with us. It's not a surprising thing. It's an entirely understandable thing. Now, I believe the only solution to the Israel problem or to the problem or the crisis affecting Gaza and the Palestinians is for a unified state where Palestinians and Jews live as equals, not as under a system of apartheid, perhaps worse than that that exist, existed in South Africa. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, look, all the conflicts we're discussing are horrific. We don't want that. No one wants war. No one wants the sort of abuses that we're seeing across the, across the world in the areas you've discussed. Um, what occurred on October the 7th, and I'll give you my, my own take on this as, a, as someone now involved politically, um, was horrific, and it clearly mobilised what I would call the Western world in, in defence of Israel, suffering that moment. What's occurred, though, since then has obviously changed our perspective, because what, what effectively happened was Hamas goaded Israel into disproportionate reaction. That's what's occurred. Now, my, our foreign secretary has been one of the most critical in the Western world of Israel. And that's something which I'm proud that we've taken that view, um, to push them to try and get towards a restoration so that things are, are brought back to normal. And clearly what we want to do here is to get to a resolution where we can get to a, a two-state solution and we can restore. We can restore peace and stop the genocides taking place. 
on the point, you also mentioned the point of Ukraine. Um, I'm very concerned about what feels like a very new Cold War emerging in Europe because I'm that generation that was in the 80s remembered the threat of nuclear war, the fear that we had watching shows like Threads, which terrified me. Um, so? Well, because well, because a major power has invaded another. That's why. I mean, that's happened. Russia invaded. Russia invaded Ukraine. I know they had the reasons. They, they claim it's part of their of their culture. They, it's part of Russia, but I don't agree with that. You know, Ukraine is a sovereign state, and that sovereignty has been violated, and we therefore have to defend them. Because if we don't, there are more dangerous things coming our way, which could well lead to nuclear war such as incursions against those Baltic states and Poland. So I don't want this situation, but Russia brought this on it. Thank you very much. I disagree. <laughs> uh, yes, yep, right of response, yes. Just a bit on, on the question of Ukraine. Um, we, we, will, we will come back to you. So I'm just I do not believe that Britain has any interest in Ukraine. I think Britain is stoking conflict in Ukraine. They're sending yes. weapons. They're telling them to fire them at Russia. Yes. They're escalating the crisis. And, and this is not, a, it's not an international crisis. It's a national crisis. Yes. Our living standards were driven down. Remember they said electricity prices, gas prices, and the price of food. They all talk about inflation rate of 5% or 3% or 2%. Our inflation rate for ordinary people in London was about 40 to 50% over the last few years. Butter, bread, food, electricity, gas, rent. You count them all up for a normal person who's earning less than £40,000 a year, you had an increase in 20 to 30% in your, in, in your inflation. And that, they claimed, was down to Ukraine uh, and to defend Ukraine. The fact of the matter is the Ukrainian conflict has been going on for many, many years. Absolutely. There's nothing new about it. In 2014... The government that was elected in Ukraine was a pro-Russian government. It's always been, it was always split about 50-50. They had 52% for the government then. Yanukovych, he was pro-Russian, and the Western powers wanted to overthrow him. And so they organized and orchestrated a coup d'etat in 2014, and a violent conflict broke out in the Donbass region, and the Russians seized Crimea. And then that conflict continued. And by the way, Boris Johnson was in Parliament only two weeks ago with members of the Azov Battalion who are openly neo-Nazi. Yep. And if you look back in the news, Azov Battalion, look, date it backwards from pre-2022, you will see they're defined by Britain as terrorist organisations. And now we're supporting the terrorists. These things go back a long way. Bin Laden was a terrorist. We used to finance an arm him as well. Yes, thank you. I agree. Would you like to respond? <laughs> Just to be, to be fair. I don't deny that our lock, most of our lack of knowledge, myself included, the deeper knowledge of Ukraine and Russia, mm -hmm. will sometimes force us to oversimplify a situation yes. and accept that. Um, and very few things in life are ever black and white. You know, that's also. So you make some useful points there. The key thing is, though, Ukraine is a sovereign nation and it's been invaded twice. 2014, yes, and then more recently in 2022. That's a serious concern. And I don't want to see the potential of a world war occurring because you have someone who is essentially, I wouldn't call him the most democratic of leaders. I won't say dictator, but he's a, he's a fairly undemocratic with not a great history of, of, of democracy. Now, with almost supreme power in Russia, who mm -hmm. seems intent by his own admission on trying to recreate the Soviet Union. He said that. I mean, we've seen, we've seen the articles he's but written he's not interested about a greater in Europe. Russia. He's not interested in Europe. Well, I would beg to... Well, I don't think he's interested in Europe. What I, what I see... Okay. Yeah. What do you think the solution is? Well, people tried to just what solutions. I mean, well, mm. at that time when we were sort of in that situation, well, we didn't have politics anyway. Mm. These days, thank goodness, Ukraine has got the whole world behind them to help them. Obviously, it's not 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's like not all Russians, it's just the you know the power. Thank you so much. Thank you. I want to break, but we've got we're just time wise. Okay, thank you thank you so much. Certainly at the time we want to get more questions in. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, that's good. Fabulous. Thank okay. Thank you. Um, I have a question that somebody um, asked me to put they didn't want to go on camera, so I'm gonna ask that question. Um, and then we'll have time definitely for more. It's what local issues would you effectively like to address if you were elected? So just focusing quickly on local issues, because obviously that's important. Um, can we start, please, with uh, yeah. Lee? Yeah. Um, I've got three. I'll, I'll start with this one. I don't agree with Labour's plans, not just plans, but their approach around the infill of West Putney Estates. Now, <laughs> I get really annoyed, and they are lies, lies that Labour and Liberal politicians say in these debates, that it was a Tory idea. The truth is, and this is the truth, those of you, many in this room, have done your research, these were ideas that were proposed by civil servants in 2017 and re-proposed in 2020. It was a Conservative administration. No Tory politician said, let's build on it. What they did is they say, civil servants make proposals that we can look at. In 2017, those proposals were rejected. In 2020, there was an examination of putting an extra floor on top of Innes Gardens. The councillor in charge of housing, Councillor Cook, started to pursue it. But very quickly, there was a groundswell of opinion against it, which Councillor Steffi Suters championed and opposed. That is not a Conservative push against you. Those were then binned because the, because the policy was very simple. We will only pursue these ideas, quote, with the will of the people accepting it. That's a conservative view. We never pushed on people. Once you said no, we backed off. Labour don't recognise that. They're pushing it forward regardless. Consultation is cynical. Very, very cynical. There's no list of well, several things. A, it's cynical. There's no, there's, no, there's no creativity around the process. They're simply saying, build, build, build. They're not building very well either. Look at Lennox Gardens, an 18-storey tower, which, by the way, <laughs> is a cost of absolute fortune. The average unit cost per unit in that block is £450,000. £450,000 to build. That includes no land cost. For that sort of money, you could buy a nice duplex in Ballister Power Station. So there's no, there's no creative thinking about this at all. They're just thinking you know, in a box, build, build, build. I would, number one, oppose that. I'm sorry, I've gone over time. I'd have, that's the thing I feel passionately about, as you know. There are two others which I'd love to talk more about, which are Hammersmith Bridge and the High Street. We'll, we'll come back. We'll come back to you. Don't worry. Yeah. Tim. Yeah. 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 You said it wasn't the conservative policy to build on local land. Conservatives that push to build on local land are the ground... Uh, in yeah. the uh, Arts Academy, was yeah. the Conservatives that built on school yeah. grounds. That's fair. How and is that fair? No, 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 no. Just, that's that's so, so, your point is fair. No, no, no. I mean, your point is fair. Right. Um, and I'm not defending that at all. Well, you just said that that. I'm, I'm talking about what's, what we're facing right now. Right. And I will absolutely fight that. I wasn't, um, to be fair, I wasn't around when that happened, with the art the land being taken off. I've got to say, with my current view, it's very hard to defend that. But I, I mean, I, I've tried to be transparent with you. I will absolutely fight for you against this development. Yeah. I've made that quite clear. Those of you who know me well, I've fought. No one else has done that. I've done that, and that's absolutely something I'll stand by all the way. So you've got my, my word on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. From a superficial reading... Um, we'll, we'll come back to you. Let's let Heiko speak and then we'll come back to you. From a superficial reading of what's happened on the estate here, I can't give you 
like detailed answers about the thing. I'm not from here. I do know some people in the state here, but not really in enough detail to give a proper response. My basic attitude towards these questions are about how an MP can impact a community, if you like, when a community movement gets going, how can an MP impact that? Because an MP doesn't have the finances to make a difference. The council make, basically makes decisions about these things, and the MP can simply put their face on one side or another debate. Where the people are engaged in, in, in fighting something, I will stand alongside them, and that's basically all an MP can do. In relation to the other major questions, I think traffic and transport obviously around here is a big question. Um, Hammersmith Bridge, which no doubt everyone's going to have some view on, I think that basically it illustrates the complete incompetence of the entire apparatus of infrastructure development in Britain. And we had a member from the Reform Party who was a military bot, and I said they could, they could in three weeks, they could build a bridge to bypass, uh, to go on the side of Hammersmith Bridge. And he turned around and said, no, 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 one week. Like He's a Sanders bot, you know. So in one week they could do it. And it wasn't any doubt about it. He was absolutely certain they could do it. Yeah. Build something to facilitate that. There is, however, uh, and this is a sort of insipid policy pursued by the Labour Party in particular, but also by others, and that is a policy that you have supposedly green policies, slowing down the traffic to 20 miles an hour, putting cycle lanes everywhere so it slows down the traffic even more until it becomes almost unbearable to drive a car. And they claim that it's pollution, they claim that the children are going to be killed by cars, but in reality, the evidence for that is minimal or zero. But they're promoting agendas which basically lock, you know, like the lockdowns were carried out on society as a whole, they sort of have this theory internationally that if you keep people enclosed in particular spaces, in particular areas, somehow that's going to save the environment. By the environment, they say, climate change and the world is going to be destroyed tomorrow. And that idea, I think, is false. I don't think the world's going to be destroyed by climate change, and nor do I think that anything we do in Britain, anything we do in Britain, will make the slightest difference, even if all their theories were right. Britain does not produce enough CO2, and I don't think CO2 is to blame, but if Britain does not produce enough CO2 to make the slightest difference even if everybody died in Britain tomorrow, it would not make any difference whatsoever. So all the measures they're taking are not actually to mitigate climate change, they're to control the behaviour of the population. There are people who use computers, artificial intelligence and so on, to try and plan out how to manipulate people. And I think we need to move away from this sort of control over people and let people have control over their lives themselves. And that would be my general approach. Two minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, are we okay with that answer? People have, it's been quite well covered, I believe, I think. Okay, uh, so let's have... I've got a uh, comment on that. So you said oh, yes, yes. A, a local MP should be behind the local people. I 100% agree with you. My only comment is, and it was directed to Fleur, who is in this room, she was put into power backed by momentum, okay? <laughs> She was put into power because of the people who uh, were joined to the Momentum Party went out street by street and put her in power. Yeah. And she, in my opinion, has defied what the local people want. Yeah? My, an example of that is she abstained from the first vote for the ceasefire for Gaza. Yeah? If she had an inch of credibility she would have voted for a ceasefire. You have to think about what kind of person abstains for a vote for peace. That's who she is. And I would ask you all to bear that in mind when you come to vote. Okay, we probably have time for about two more questions. So. Um, you had your hand up at the back at the very beginning, so I'll, I'll take a question from the back. We, we, might get, we might just get three in, but certainly two more. Yep. How close do you want me? Not, not, not too close. Is that all right? Move because I don't want to show these people here. I'll just have a statement first. The, the first one is a statement. I just think that we have to remember 
the Conservative government will say whatever they, whatever they want you to hear at the time when they're telling you, and, and, and they never ever answer the question. Now, my question is, what can we do about the press? Because these are the people who you, politicians and MPs, are telling your stories to. What can we do about them manipulating everybody else's mind in the situation that we're in today? I think the press is enormously powerful and should not be enormously powerful. Um, it's legacy from having newspapers fired at you, but human society is like that. We carry the weight of the past on our shoulders and respond, if you like, to that. Normally, in normal times, we go along with that weight. And actually, people generally become only aware of what lying nonsense comes out of the mass media when they do something that gets reported in the media and then they see this complete nonsense in, in, in the media. In fact, only yesterday, I, had to, I was sent a, a message about the election in, or a, a me, a, about an article in the Standard newspaper, uh, or the Standard Online it is now, and it showed the Putney election, it said, and it didn't mention the Workers' Party and it didn't mention Rejoin EU. And then I wrote to the electoral officer in Wandsworth and he told me this is a police matter. It's illegal for the newspapers not to report the other candidates. And yet, there they are. The standard newspaper is pre quite prepared to manipulate the election in their interests. We had the same thing yesterday, to be fair. Uh, Lee was the only person who stood up. Yesterday, when there was a, a Hustings debate, uh, where the, all the parties are supposed to be invited, I was not invited, and nor was the uh, uh, Leave EU. And when I, when I wrote to the candidates, Lee, in all Rejoin due respect EU, to him, turned around and said, he, he wrote to them and said, you can read out a statement, I will not come, because I do not believe Hustings should take place without the candidates being allowed to attend. And I agree with that. <laughs> now, the real danger, however is no longer really the mass media. The real danger is the big tech giants who manipulate all of us on a daily basis, and we don't even know it. We don't even know. You know, you know when you go on there and something, it says something that, about you that, that you didn't know or it gets you to buy something that you thought, oh, where did that come from? Oh, that's good. All these things are manipulation. They're gathering all the information. It's a gigantic... That's the reason why I talk more about global things than local things. They're gathering all the information for all of us every day. Every minute of every day, they're gathering that you're here. They're gathering what you, who you're associated with, who you messaged earlier on, what you're going to say later on. All that's harvested. It's like we're at, our, our activity on the internet is harvested and used against us. And the more these entities continue to expand exponentially with their speed of growth of artificial intelligence and so on, the more dangerous it is for us. And therefore, like at one of the meetings I turned and I said, well, you need, we, need, we do need to develop a culture of leaving the mobile phone behind, of attending real meetings, of meeting other human beings, of discussing with them without the manipulation by, by, by the internet and by the corporate giants. That's we need to learn months. that culture and develop it and inculcate that into our children. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Lee. Um, interesting, because I, I find myself agreeing with, with a lot of that. Um, what I can say, look, my background is, is working in advertising, sales and media. And the first thing which is absolute true evidence is that the, the press in particular is in severe decline. It is. Um, people aren't reading anymore. It's not being replaced by online. Advertising is going through the floor. Um, most newspapers are loss-making organisations now. I mean, the only one which is <coughs> holding its way is the, is the Daily Mail, um, for lots of reasons. But so press has a crisis point anyway, which that people, if you work in the press, you'd say it's a crisis because free speech is being affected. If you don't work in the press, you'll say, well, good riddance, because you guys were, were biased anyway. Uh, most to the right, a few to the left. Um, I think there is certainly truth that the online, online has become, or online social media has become a much more powerful tool in this election, so the last couple of elections, than the press is. And I think that's an issue that Murdoch will gnash his teeth and grind his teeth over as he goes to the grave because that's always been his, his great power and that's fading away now. Um, I, I'd love to talk for longer because this is a huge issue, a huge issue that Heiko's just touched on there. Um, I, 
I think he has a, makes a very valid point about the power of online. I don't believe it's a conspiracy by individuals. I think it's one of the, the chances we have of technology. That there's a phrase I used before, which I call it Frankenstein's monster moments, and we're living through that now. Um, we talked before about the, about the gender debate. Um, I do, you know, you, you make a point that there are those that were pushing that agenda who may come for California, who may be billionaires. I don't think it's necessarily a, a conspiracy policy, but I do think what's occurring now is the, is the, is the role of algorithms in online is creating a distorted perspective, um, which is actually threatening th free speech. I don't believe it's any individual or individuals driving it. I think it's technology driving it. I call it Frankenstein's monster moment. Time. Sorry. You could also Thank say you. COVID and how COVID allegedly got out is also another Frankenstein's monster moment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, does that answer his question? Okay. So. Can I just come back to the point that, that was made? The question was, how do you and how do you control the press? Not one candidate mentioned introducing legislation to ensure that one individual, which is, which is, and it is one individual that sits behind these humongous corporations, and I'm talking about the Murdochs, the, the guy who owns um, the Daily, Me Daily Mail, Lord, Lord Ruckman. These are individuals. They do have an agenda. They do push a narrative through the, the press and the um, newspapers that they own. Yeah. So for you, for you to say that it's not an individual conspiracy, I would have to. Uh, I would dis fundamentally disagree with that. It's an individual. They are individuals who are pushing their own narrative. To control the press, you have to be able to limit people like. The Murdochs and so on and so forth to own those. Uh, I'm going to give 30 seconds quickly to come to If you want to. Um, plurality of ownership is, is there in our communications legislation. Um, yeah. And that's often taken in the, in the round of ownership of radio, ownership of TV, ownership okay, well, okay. Of, of newspapers and so on. Um, okay. Rightly or wrongly, and it's obviously an issue of debate, it's felt to be that there was a plurality of ownership. Um, there isn't just one owner of, Mur of, of Murdoch that's known all the press, he owns a part of it. Rothermere in the same way. My limited experience, as I don't know these people, is that it's very rarely is it one big individual pushing the buttons. There may be one or two differences there, but in the case of the individual you, you've discussed, I don't think it's quite that powerful. And I think also their own power is being massively eroded by social media, which doesn't necessarily have a clear cut agenda. And that's the technology point I was making earlier Thank you. on. Yes, Yes, I do agree with you, but at the same time, the social media giants are more powerful now. And, and the manipulation that they carry out through algorithms, but they're, they're, they're tricky, tricked algorithms. They're not algorithms that, that give equality to, 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 to people to get access to information. Some people are pushed to the side, others are not. Some people are promoted, others are not. And there is some kind of conspiracy going on there, and that I know for a short, for sure, because I've had the same censorship from social media, um, YouTube channel closed down, stuff like that. I, I actually went to Google, and they're now scared of me, because I, whenever I go to Google, last time I went to Google, it was me and uh, one other person. They shut the whole building down you know, as soon as I arrived. And then uh, the staff were coming up and saying, say, it's one guy, what are you doing? You know, because, but uh, the social media companies are the players now. And, and, of course, some individuals with a bit of money and resources have been able to get influence. So Tucker Carlson or, or, or Russell Brand and people like that are able to get influence. But uh, from the grassroots, we should promote some method by which the algorithms can allow or break the algorithm power so that people can get their information out independently of this. And th this was the great opportunity provided by the internet but it's not been realised. It's become a sort of caged animal. Thank you, Heiko. Lovely. OK, so we've got time for one more question. Leave, you've been waiting for quite a long time? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. OK. Um, I'll tell you what, um, can we, can, can, what, what we could do is very quick question, very quick answers, very quick question, very quick answers. Can we do it like that? Yes. Yeah, OK, and we'll do that. OK.
regard to mental health of people in Putney and the constituency and then um, what you personally if you become our MP what are you going to go and do to improve the mental health of people in Putney? The impact of COVID because it took us away from the things that keep us mentally healthy. You know, fresh air, company, company. Um, what would I do to make this? Well, number one, protect the green space. Encourage people to be to be encourage people to be engaged. I'm personally so much happier and have been the last four years since I got out of just do working and doing work, by getting involved in in things like this, things like other things I'm doing, which are just get me involved with people. So there's, I can always say the best the best way to get mentally healthy is to be involved in things, participate in clubs, associations, even politics, just to take control of your community. That's what I always recommend, because I know it works for me. Well, lovely. Thank you very much. That was a really short response. Love it. <laughs> Thank you. Heiko. Essentially, community is the essence of it. I mean, mental health is a relationship between people. So those who are isolated, if they have a schizophrenic breakdown or something like that, most people who suffer from that type of thing can recuperate but there's a medicalization of these questions, and I think that's a generic problem in the world today, is that we medicalize or we've accepted the medicalization of everything. In other words, you give someone some drugs and that makes them better. And we can see what happened with that. I mean, in the United States of America with the Sackler crisis and the opioid epidemic, you've got something like half a million people, young people, have been killed in the opioid epidemic over the last few years, about 100,000 people a year, dying about an average age of 30 to 40 years of age. So... This is one aspect to it, and, and the lack of collectivity, and then the other aspect to it is what we're talking about, the internet. People having mobile phones all the time. We all do it, but we all need to become consciously aware of it and separate ourselves from it, because this is destroying the mental health of the entire society. That we used to go on trains and talk to people. Thank we you, Heiko. Get, sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I want to get one more question in. I suspect we would have had a mass audience here this evening if only people had found the way in. It was when <laughs> Ali and I were struggling that we met this evening and I was horrified to find the treatment of him at the hands of the police. But it's nothing new, of course. Uh, I mean, I go back, I'm in my late 70s, so I go back, I've been in the borough for 56 years, uh, and I go back to reading about the police crimes they weren't fully disclosed at that time, but we know now at Notting Hill race riots. We know in almost er every area of government um, there have been, there's been criminality, and uh, frankly, it's, it, 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 the same thing happens each time. There's an inquiry, it is sat upon, and then finally the people who are found out to be guilty are not prosecuted. Right. Now, we have recently, we've got covid I'm amazed Paula Venels didn't commit suicide, either before or afterwards. Uh, we have still got things like um, uh, Grenfell Tower. Within hours of the fire, uh, it was discovered by experiment that the cladding accelerated rather than retarded the, um, the, the fire. Now, without going into conspiracy theories which I don't buy at all, rest on very little fact, I'd like each of you to tell us what advice you would give to uh, Keir Starmer as to how, for once and all, to deal with that inherent corruption. And can we please start with, I think it was, it's Heiko, your turn to start first? Yeah. Well, I wouldn't advise Keir Starmer on anything. Um, but I understand where you're coming from, you know, if, if, what, what should be done. And I think the principle goes back a long time. 
Um, and that is the idea that when you elect people, you should be able to remove them at any time. And I don't know exactly what percentage, maybe 30% of the electorate, if they have a, 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 an online vote, for example, they should be able to remove any MP, no matter what party they're from, they should be able to be removed by the constituents uh, on some kind of re-election re or recall referendum, if you like, in a local area in that way. And I think that should be applicable to all types of authority and power exercised over people. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, the precise answer is, at this stage, I don't know the exact mechanism. If I'm, honest, I'm being honest. I have to be honest. The only way to be to do this is to, at every level, create as much scrutiny as possible. I mean, that, that, that's my short, simple answer. Scrutiny is the best way. And what I said earlier on, I'm sorry it's a political point, if you've got a Labour council, a Labour mayor, a Labour government with a big majority, and you have a Labour MP, you're a little bit buggered, you know, because you're gonna, you've got no, no one to, to scrutinise for you. So democracy... Opposition, scrutiny is always the way. As much openness as we can do. Hmm? To set up an inquiry that takes 10 years. Oh, no, I agree. I don't. It's, it's, it, takes, it takes too long. So, and I can't give you a short answer. It's to find a way of speeding it up. It's to go in there with the approach to say, we've got to be more open, we need much more democracy, much more accountability in everything we do. And that's Sorry, it. Done. Me. Okay. Um, thank you so much. Um, I just want to thank um, everybody. Um, I'm afraid we literally have to be out of here by nine. So the, the caretaker's waiting. Uh, uh, I don't know. Just one, one sec. One sec. Just, one sec just, just let me let me speak for a second. Um, so um, this is. There are many more hustings planned. Okay, so please look at the leaflets that were given to you, um, and so you will have plenty more opportunity to ask questions. So I'm delighted there's been so much engagement. Um, I wish more candidates had turned up, but hopefully we will get more. The message will get through to them that we want them to come and you want to speak to them. So please come to further hustings. There'll be more opportunity to ask questions. Some of them are very themed. We're sort of experimenting with this as an idea. Um, hopefully it work, it's working. We'll, we'll, we'll finesse it as we go. Um, but please come to further hustings. You'll have the opportunity to ask questions, engage in further debate. Um, but for now, we really do have to end it. And I just want to thank very much to Heiko Ku for coming here and for Lee Roberts for coming here as well. And to you for your questions. Thank you very, very, very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Well, you've got loads of opportunities. So for those of you who are watching, my name is Wendell Daniel, and welcome to Street Mike, and we're now coming to an end, and we will be back on Sunday from 1 to 5 p.m. at Speaker's Corner. So this has been an opportunity for you to discover what goes on at a hustings and hopefully if you are taking interest on here you can maybe attend the hustings in your own area wherever you live but all I can say is my name is Wendell Daniel from Street Night Live Stream we're now coming to an end because I have a funeral to prepare for tomorrow morning so thank you very much for watching when I press stop you're going to see my ugly mug come up on a slate, as it's called, for about three minutes. So my picture is now going to come up as I shut off, but we're now closing down. So thank you very much for watching, and goodbye. <laughs>